Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Tracy Cook with Sachs Healthcare Communications, and I'll be your webinar producer for today's webinar on improving asthma self-management and control in pediatrics and young adults. Our moderator for today's session is Tim Opholt. Dr. Opholt is a professor and chair, Department of Respiratory Care and Cardiopulmonary Sciences, University of South Alabama, Mobile, Alabama. He is also the Director of Breath and Life, COPD and Asthma Education and Therapy Program, Victoria Health Partners Clinic, Mobile, Alabama. Tim has written several books and book chapters as well as published numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals. He has presented on COPD and asthma-related topics at various national medical conferences. Tim, welcome. Thank you, Tracy, for that very kind introduction. And thanks to Phillips for providing support for this educational activity. The title of today's webinar is Improving Asthma Self-Management and Control in Pediatrics and Young Adults. We are fortunate to have two extremely qualified speakers today presenting on this very important and timely topic, Bill Pruitt and Karen Gregory. Our first speaker is Bill Pruitt. Bill is currently Director of Clinical Education in the Cardiorespiratory Sciences Program at the University of South Alabama in Mobile. Bill is a member of the editorial advisory boards for two monthly healthcare publications and has published over 100 articles of interest on pulmonary topics. He has also given numerous presentations at state, national, and international gatherings. Bill has served on the board of directors and as president of the Association of Asthma Educators. And he is currently serving on the National Asthma Education Certification Board of Directors. Our second speaker is Karen Gregory. Dr. Gregory currently works with the Oklahoma Allergy and Asthma Clinic in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Karen is also assistant professor at Georgetown University School of Nursing and Health Studies. She lectures extensively on issues related to allergy, asthma, and other pulmonary diseases, and is published in these areas. She has served on the national, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, she has served on the Association of Asthma Educators Board of Directors, and served as the organization president in 2008 and 2009. Karen is a fellow of the American Association for Respiratory Care, she serves as a faculty member of the American Association for Respiratory Care Asthma Preparatory Course, Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease Educator Course, and the Political Advocacy Contact Team representing Oklahoma. Her research interests include asthma disparity with emphasis on improving functional health of the patient with asthma and their family. Bill, Pru Bill Pruitt discloses that he's a member of the NAECB Board of Directors, and he's an advisory board member for RT for Decision Makers and Nursing 2019. Karen Gregory uh, is on the American Academy of Allergy, and, uh, Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, CME, MOC, and she's on the Speakers Bureau for Novartis Pharmaceutical and Pfizer. And neither speaker has a conflict of interest in this presentation that will influence his or her presentation. With respect to continuing education for physicians, a link to obtain continuing education credits will be available at the conclusion of the webinar. And this activity is jointly provided by Synaptive and SACS Healthcare Communications. The accreditation statement for physicians is listed here and support for this educational activity is provided by Phillips Respironics. In terms of continuing education for nurses and respiratory therapists, this activity is, a, is approved for one contact hour for nurses and respiratory therapists, and the accreditation statement is here. Now I would like to turn over the presentation to my friend and colleague, Bill Pruitt. Thank you, Tim, for that nice introduction, and welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, we'll start off today again talking about improving asthma self-management and control in pediatrics and young adults. And I'd like to begin with a, a look at healthcare provider and patient family issues in our slides. 
the objectives, these are the global objectives for this entire seminar. Uh, we will be discussing the, pre the published guidelines for evidence-based medicine or evidence-based practice. Uh, number two, you can see the discussing problems and issues in clinical practice. And then we hope to explore some practical recommendations to address these problems. Uh, one thing to, to start off with, um, there are two uh, nationally or actually internationally published guidelines here. Uh, the first listed here is the GINA guidelines. What we call GINA is the Global Initiative for Asthma. This is updated annually and there is an, a 2019 update available. Uh, this is a collaborative project between the National Heart Lung and Blood Institute uh, from the National Institutes of Health here in the United States and the other partner in this would be the World Health Organization. The other guidelines which were published in 2007 are what we call EPR3. Uh, these are the guidelines for diagnosis and management of asthma and it's the expert panel review number three so that's where the title or EPR3 comes from. And this was put out through the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the NIH here in the United States. So these are the two um, guidelines that most people talk about when we're discussing uh, published guidelines for evidence-based practice. And you should be aware of these. Uh, and I think the one that's really driving uh, our uh, work these days is the GINA guidelines from 2019, since they're the most uh, up-to-date. If we look at some of the, just a quick look at the issues, uh, there was a published report from the uh, MMWR from 2019 uh, where they took a look at a, a large group of, uh, of patients that have asthma looking particularly at children uh, in this survey but there was over 11,000 respondents and the important pieces that fell out as they were looking at this about half of them had received a written asthma action plan which we will talk a little bit about later in the talk but that's an important part of uh, trying to help people manage their asthma. Uh, only 54% of the surveyed who were taking control of medications were taking them regularly as prescribed. 9% uh, were overusing their medications, the rescue medications, which means they were using more than three inhalers in the past three months. And only 46% had re received advice on environmental control. So these are some important pieces that uh, we need to address as we're trying to help people who are dealing with asthma. Uh, the question here, why are the gaps between the recommended care and current practice? Well, well there's a large group of uh, professionals who deal with asthma, and you can see the list here from physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, respiratory therapists, nurses, pharmacists, social workers, uh, community health workers, and others. And uh, the, I've got a list of healthcare provider issues that we'll look at in a little bit more detail, but you can see uh, there's several different things here to consider as you look at your own practice and how you're dealing with patients who have asthma. So let's take a look at these a little closer. Uh, one is the team-based approach, uh, and there's a limited use of team-based approach, I think, uh, nationwide as we see how are people um, working with asthma patients. Uh, Gina recommends that a team-based approach be used, particularly with those difficult to treat patients and severe asthma patients uh, in adults and in adolescents. And it comes in very handy to help assess uh, the severe asthma phenotypes, those who have uh, these different phenotypes of asthma, uh, the um, folks who have incomplete reversal for airflow obstruction, for example, in obesity, uh, the allergic and non-allergic, et cetera. And then there's also factors that contribute to symptoms. Having a team-based approach often can help you explore those, uh, looking at the quality of life and examining exacerbations and how we can deal with that. Uh, the team approach increases the identification of comorbidities and improves outcomes. So the questions would be, um, how are you doing with this? Are you involving uh, other professionals that can give you a, a well-rounded look at these uh, asthma patients? And the other part, part of this team is going to be the patient and or the parent or caregiver. Uh, there really needs to be a collaborative approach to encourage what we call buy-in for the plan of care to make sure that those folks who are suffering from asthma or their parent or caregiver are included uh, throughout the time of uh, dealing with this and how to plan and put together a good uh, approach to handling their asthma. 
poor communication sometimes is an issue for uh, uh, the professions and the professionals, um, and one is using a paternalistic approach. Uh, this is the idea that the doctor knows best, uh, the doctor is going to make the decisions on the asthma action plan or the asthma care plan and really not involving the patient in putting these plans together. Uh, there was a study from 2010 that looked at uh, general practitioners and the, they were inclined on at the level of about 35 percent to use a more paternalistic approach and then also looking at respiratory medicine specialists uh, in this survey almost a third, 29 percent, we're more inclined to use that paternalistic approach. Uh, so the question here, and what you might want to explore in your practice, uh, is are you using a more autonomous approach to improve communication and patient adherence with the plan that you're putting together together? Ineffective teaching is another issue that uh, sometimes approach or comes up during the course of handling asthma. Uh, the written materials for uh, patients may be written at a, a high reading level and they recommend that about a fifth grade reading level is used uh, for materials that we're going to be handing to a patient. Um, there's word processing software that can give a re readability score on your materials. Um, you can search the web for this. And, uh, and actually scan your materials and see what kind of reading level do you have. Uh, language barriers are another issue uh, where it may affect your teaching effectiveness. Uh, are your materials only available in English? Um, there are tools on, on the internet, for example, Google Translate uh, can give a great place to start to take your um, English materials and translate them over into other languages for your area. Um, using models of the airway to teach about a normal uh, airway configuration versus what does the airway look like during an asthma attack to show it, what is bronchospasm, what does that mean, inflammation in the airways, mucus. Uh, these models are very effective sometimes in getting, the, getting across to a patient what is asthma, how does this work and why am I suffering. Um, teaching uh, is a big piece all the way through and making sure that we're effective in what we do, but that needs to be included in all visits to help patients understand uh, asthma, what is it, uh, also to help motivate them for adherence. Um, the medication delivery and particularly inhaler technique really needs to be checked with every visit. Um, this is an important piece. Uh, we explain things to patients and say, here's how you use this, and they walk out of the office and you ask them next time they come back and it's just as if they'd never seen it before. So that happens uh, where patients just, they just don't get it. So uh, as every visit needs to include a review of medication and inhaler technique. Um, it's unfortunate, but knowledge of correct uh, inhaler technique, they did a lot of studies have shown that there's a lack of knowledge uh, and it happens across the board. Physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, uh, or sometimes themselves not uh, up to speed and, and experts in how to use inhalers in the right way. They found that most often missed uh, parts of you know the essentials here, uh, shaking the canisters. A lot of the MDIs need to be kind of agitated, uh, shake, shaken before you use it. Uh, patients need to be instructed to blow out first before they take their deep breath in on the inhaler. Uh, Instruction on proper inspiratory flow is important. Uh, if you don't breathe in uh, with a, a good proper inspiratory flow, you can um, maybe either inhale the medication straight into the back of the oral pharynx, or you may not be breathing in fast enough to pull through and get, for example, a dry powder inhaler. So airflow is important and instruction there. And then the final piece that's missed a lot is the breath hold. Uh, there is a recommendation with just about every inhaler we use uh, to have a breath hold of maybe five to ten seconds. So these are things that can help as far as uh, your practice and what you're doing with the patients who have asthma. Another part that we want to talk about just briefly is the limited knowledge of or maybe not following the published guidelines. Uh, again, the survey that we had from 2010 uh, discussing or asking about this with general practitioners and with respiratory medicine specialists. Um, they surveyed these folks and asked about the asthma control test as an objective measure and only 20% of the general practitioners were using the ACT. 
a little less than half of the respiratory medicine specialists were using the ACT as a measure of control. Uh, they also gave these uh, professionals uh, uh, scenario, patient scenarios, and asked them to identify the level of control. And you can see the results here that uh, it was it was not that good. <laughs> About 12% of the general practitioners and 20% of the uh, respiratory medicine specialists were able to correctly identify the level of control. And then with those who had, uh, that was with uh, patients who had control asthma and patients who had poorly or partly controlled asthma uh, came in at 22.8% and 28.3% respectively for those practitioners. Use of an asthma action plan is another part of the uh, issues that we may have with the, with the professionals who are there uh, working with asthma patients. Uh, Gina recommends or, or actually uh, you can look through the guidelines, there's over 65 references in Gina 2019 for using a written asthma action plan. Uh, a study from 2005, which was a uh, prospective open randomized parallel group controlled trial uh, looking at 60 children between 5 and 12 years old, um, three months after starting uh, use of the asthma action plan and they found uh, that there were significantly fewer asthma, acute asthma events, fewer days out of school. Uh, you can see night, nocturnal awakenings, uh, better overall symptom scores here. And that was a while back in 2005, a more recent study published in 2018 found again with using an asthma action plan, it seemed to change how often they were having to go to the emergency room, uh, their outpatient office visits, their admission days for hospitalization, and an improvement in the uh, number of days missed from school. So the asthma action plan is important, uh, but that sometimes gets overlooked with the uh, professionals who are working with asthma patients. Going to the next slide here, we can see time constraints uh, is a big piece of, of how we may be missing uh, helping these folks with asthma. A typical office visit for a physician may run from between 10 to 16 minutes. Uh, there was a study showing that a child with acute asthma, the office visit expanded to maybe 24 minutes. In our experience, uh, we work with uh, mostly adult patients, but uh, with our first visit, a lot of times we will spend 45 to 60 minutes with a patient going through a lot of different pieces and parts of trying to help them with their first time visit and talking about asthma. So you can see that the activities that we do here uh, including uh, the history and physical spirometry. If we see obstruction, we do a pre and post bronchodilator test. We may need to get a chest x-ray. Uh, we do teaching about the disease, about the medications, about the delivery devices. Uh, we encourage them to get a, uh, their vaccinations. If there's smoking involved, either with the patient or with the parent, we may go through some smoking cessation uh, activities. We put together an asthma action plan. We answer their questions. Uh, so it's a pretty long time here to, to do this, but it's really needed and a lot of patients express uh, great appreciation by the time we end with this to say, nobody's ever told me about this. Uh, with our follow-up visits, it may take some 15 to 30 minutes as we're back together with these patients on a second or sometimes third visit, um, taking a look at things like the ACT, the asthma control test and, and assessing their level of control. We always review inhaler technique with our patients and we'll answer questions and reinforce teaching with that follow-up visit. Now, if you have patients who have comorbid conditions, uh, the time that we can dedicate or use for teaching and working with asthma sometimes gets uh, eaten away. So things like uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, again, smoking can be an issue if they have uh, sleep-related problems with obstructive sleep apnea, and then other issues um, for children, childhood obesity is big, uh, allergic rhinitis, depression, uh, food allergies, uh, sometimes difficulty with emotions or concentration or the behavior or getting along and just, you know, those are the kind of issues that we have to sometimes include as we're uh, dealing with the uh, asthma patients in the practice. Um, this last slide here for me, uh, I'm kind of looking at the patient and family issues and, and we didn't drill down into this because I think Karen's going to address a lot of these issues in her side of the talk, 
but uh, health literacy and language barriers with these patients uh, are they able to understand what we're saying to them and how we're presenting information uh, poor inhaler technique is a big issue that needs to be like I said often uh, touched on with every visit uh, poor adherence to our plan uh, sometimes they may not uh, understand what we want to do or they may be, re be reluctant or there may be barriers to them being able to uh, follow uh, what we're trying to put forward as a plan together with them as we do a, a, a partnership here. Uh, we touched on comorbidities that can be a problem that the patient's having to deal with uh, smoking again and now we're seeing a lot of information hit the news about e-cigarettes and vaping. Uh, Psychosocial issues, family dynamics can impact what's going on for asthma control and adherence. Um, we also have a problem a lot of times with a split family and continuity of care. Are they staying with the mother? Are they staying with the father or the grandparent? Uh, do they have access to the medications? Are they uh, able to have the resources available when they're going from spot to spot? Also care during school hours, uh, sometimes that can be an issue. Uh, environmental problems and ex continued exposure uh, in the home environment or at, at work or at school uh, is another thing that patients and families have to deal with and that we can help uh, try and uh, point them in a good direction. And then lack of participation in the care plan, are they actually being involved again? Like I said, the team approach really needs to include that patient or the, the uh, parent or caregiver in trying to put together a good workable plan that everybody can uh, agree on and go forward with. So these are some of the things that uh, that I've identified looking at it from, from the aspect of what we have here and some of our practice and I would like now to turn this over to my peer and colleague here Dr. Gregory Karen. Uh, is going to now take a look at the practical interventions in clinical practice. So, Karen. Thank you, Bill, and thank you very much for your nice, your great presentation. Um, I learned a lot, you know, and I want to also welcome you all for to our webinar. We've had a great time uh, preparing this for you. So now let's talk about practical interventions in clinical practice. What can we as healthcare professionals, healthcare providers, asthma educators do to implement best practice and what interventions do we need? So first of all, Bruce Bender once said, our behavior can either protect our health or it can put it at risk. How we behave is imperative to self-management. Successful self-management is dependent upon our patient's actions and it's also dependent upon our patient's behavior. So we wanna remember when we're looking at achieving good asthma control, asthma control is best achieved when our patients and their family or caregivers make concentrated efforts to control environmental triggers. Um, they need to understand how to identify worsening symptoms. They need to maintain a strong impact and a strong relationship or contact with us as the health, as the asthma team. That will show that adhere, that will help them adhere to their medical treatment regimen. So asthma education and self-management are, are essential components of our um, asthma care team, accessible requirements that we need to understand. Poor asthma control can be um, related to a lack of assessment by us as the healthcare professional. Or um, another thing we see is patients may underestimate what uh, the control really looks like. I know um, when I go to the dentist every time, I'm always instructed to how to refloss, refloss my teeth. And I say, I know how to do this. But when I'm watched, um, my dental hygienist says, no, that's incorrect. We need to do that with our patients. Show us how you are implementing your medical treatment regimen, how you are um, uh, using your uh, devices, and how are you trying to achieve best control. We look back on studies um, looking at from vital signs in the, the United States from the, one of the MMWR reports from 20, um, to, to 2006 to 2010 that more than 38% of children with asthma had uncontrolled disease. I see that today in clinical practice. Despite the avail availability of these evidence-based guidelines that 
that Bill told us about, evidence-based medications that were used, new new medications, state-of-the-art uh, biologics, new uh, inhalers. Patients with poorly controlled asthma have poor adherence problems and they have a poor recognition of symptoms. And that's where we need to, um, to, to help them. So asthma is one of the most common diseases of, or chronic illnesses of children. Diagnosing asthma is, as a very young child is often challenging. Um, some providers say that it's that you cannot diagnose asthma until age two, which we we know the evidence-based practice guidelines uh, do not implement that. We the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported in 2017, approximately 8.4% of pediatric asthma uh, is, in, is in the United States. And then among school-aged children, it increases to approximately 10%. Bill told us about evidence-based practice guidelines. When we look at the GINA document for uh, asthma self-management, the evidence is clear. The GINA document tells us we want to provide skills and support for guided self-asthma management. We want to treat modifiable risk factors, and we also want to comprise self-monitoring, uh, recognizing, identifying signs and symptoms of worsening asthma, as well as peak flow monitoring, written asthma action plan, and regular medical review. The expert panel report three that was published in 2007 also looks at routine monitoring of symptoms, lung functions, patient education, again, a vital part, a key part, uh, and controlling the environment and comorbid conditions that con contribute to the severity of asthma and pharmacological treatment. So why do we need asthma self-management programs? Well, healthcare professionals we see have a responsibility. When we started in this great profession, we gave a commitment to, to administer best patient care. We have a responsibility to confirm every patient with asthma has, a, has the appropriate treatment regimen and they understand um, knowledge and they, to, how to optimize their asthma control. We have with us evidence-based guidelines, and the, uh, remember Bill told us the GINA documents are, are updated every year. Um, last one time is up this year, uh, April 2019, with some good new recommendations. But the guidelines determine asthma self-management and appropriate asthma care interventions actually improves asthma control. It reduces asthma exacerbation. It decreases healthcare utilization, and it improves our patients' quality of life. We also want to empower our patients if um, we see that when we empower, empower our patients with knowledge, knowledge is power. When we empower our patients with knowledge, they achieve better control. And patients with asthma, we must understand, face multiple challenges. And we need to understand as their asthma educator and healthcare provider and professional that they need to ever overcome barriers and we need to be right by their side as they uh, achieve their goals. Asthma self-management represents a systematic approach of educating, um, of educating patients to achieve disease control. One of the key components of effective chronic illness and improved asthma outcomes is asthma self-management. We want to make sure that we implement a collaborative partnership, an interdisciplinary approach um, between the asthma educator, between the healthcare provider, between the asthma care team, and the patient. Active commitment, we want to ask them, what is your goal? What do you want to achieve? What is asthma doing to prevent you to achieve your goal? We want to have them an active commitment where they engage in their care. And we want them to understand treatment avoidances. How do they avoid treatment, uh, avoid triggers? Uh, I, I'm so sorry, I meant to say, how do, it includes trigger avoidance. Um, symptom monitoring and adherence to their medical treatment regimen. The evidence supports asthma management is overwhelming. We understand that successful implementation of self-management combines education for patients and training for healthcare professionals committed to evidence-based practice. So what's the difference between asthma education or patient education and asthma self-management? Well, self-management 
problem solves. It makes decisions. It is a, it's a team approach, but they're shared decision making. Our patient is the center of the of of the team and they have the uh, it's shared decision making. We also look at self-management to include management of, of life with disease and increase self-confidence and, and um, skill knowledge. Whereas patient education, we see increased knowledge, it changes our behavior and and we use specific tools for uh, patient education teaching devices, which, which we will be talking about. So the ultimate goal of expert care and patient self-management is to reduce the impact of asthma on, morbid, on morbidity. I could also add mortality. We want to improve functional ability and we want to improve their quality of life. The Establishing a partnership implies that healthcare professional effectiveness in managing asthma is going to increase direct proportional to the quality of asthma information provided by the patient. So how do we best communicate with our patients? The best thing is asking open-ended questions. We have an introduction. We have, um, we're, we want to elicit the patient's agenda, but when we ask open-ended questions, we are able to understand what their question or what, what they are. We want to implement patient-centered communication. We want to, when, when we're um, asking open-ended questions, especially early on, we want to be very careful not to interrupt. The literature shows that healthcare professionals generally inter interrupt a patient. We ask a question and then we interrupt within seven to nine seconds. And that just, that shuts down the patient and it, and it prohibits further engagement. Understanding that the patient's perceptive of their illness, we want what's their perception of their disease, we want to express empathy, are very, these are key features of patient-centered communication. It also implies when we're asking open-ended questions, it implies that we're interested in them, we're interested in their questions, and questions are very common. So we want to uh, engage in focus active listening. So some strategies to improve uh, our communication skills, asking open-ended questions. Communication skills need to be patient-centered and they need to include the patient's agenda. We want to ask open-ended questions with uh, introduction. We want to elicit the patient's agenda. Tell me what brings you here today. What problems are you having uh, that, that are really frustrating you or limiting you from achieving good asthma control. Open-ended questions, especially when we start early on without interrupting is imperative. Literature shows nine within nine to 10 seconds that after we've asked the question that we have already interrupted our patient. So engaging in a fo focus active listening, understanding that what is the patient's perception of their illness? How can we express empathy and recognizing that we are, that the patient is centered at the center of the care and that uh, asking these questions in open-ended fashion will, uh, in will demonstrate interest and show that that uh, we really, it's a team approach and we're really on their side. So asking open-ended questions would be those like, what would you like me to know about your asthma? What do you expect from your treatment? What concerns are you having? And what things are you worried about? What worries you and what worries your family? Other self-management strategies are how are um, implementing or implementing an approach for good adherence. So we as healthcare professionals, we must pay a close attention to patient behavior, just like we do pharmacotherapy. We, we have the best treatment regimen, best therapeutic medical regimen, but what is their behavior? So we look at patient adherence. Um, patient adherence to medical treatment regimen is a major problem in, in, in multiple chronic illnesses. And adherence to asthma medication regimen tends to be very poor. Bill told us about the MMR report where 54.5% of patients took medications regularly as prescribed. Poor adherence to self-management guidelines contributes to increased morbidity and mortality.
Medication non-adherence has been associated with increased symptoms, increased healthcare utilization, and increased oral prednisone or oral steroid requirements. Literature shows us that improved adherence may lead to improved as achieving good asthma control and improving their quality of life. So shared decision making is another strategy to improve adherence. If you tell a patient, I want you taking your medications at 7 a.m. and then again at 7 p.m., that may not be um, conducive to their to their um, you know, to their lifestyle. If, if we're talking adolescents, they may be in class already by 7 a.m. or they may have sports or band. Um, simplifying the medical treatment regimen, uh, making sure that it can be the least amount of medicine on the best control with the best best um, device and compre um, at comprehensive asthma educations with nurse home visits and then reminding the patients what can they do when they miss a dose and how can they implement reminders and then reviewing patients detailed dispensing records through their pharmacy you can call the pharmacy so if we look at adolescents most people find this population very challenging i happen to uh, love adolescents <laughs> so we uh, see at least 50 percent of adolescents and adults as bill told us do not take their medications as prescribed there are poor adherence uh, poor adherence does contribute to poor symptom control and increased risk of exacerbations more increased morbidity and mortality Healthcare professionals, we need to find innovative ways to improve medication adherence, knowing that each patient may be different. How does this fit into this particular patient's uh, quality of or, um, daily life and their, their schedules? And then modern technology, we're going to talk about that, is offering methods to facilitate and manage self-management and encourage reminders, such as texting reminders, smartphone applications, and health games that we'll, we'll be talking about in just a moment. So let's look a moment on how would we match the optimal devices for the for the uh, perfect I mean the, uh, the perfect device for the asthma the patient with asthma. Well, first of all, we want to look at characteristics or the phenotype. Phenotype like is this late onset non-allergic asthma? Is this severe allergic asthma? Obesity? Uh, we're hearing a lot now with eosinophilic asthma. Patient's ability to use the device. Is there some type of? Um, it, I mean, are they, they have difficulty with mobility? Is there some type of patients like cerebral palsy can't use the certain device? What are we going to do there? The big thing we see is, is this medication co uh, covered on their um, insurance cost reimbursement? Is this what the patient wants to take? Would the patient rather take a uh, nebulized albuterol treatment than a, than a albuterol HFA? Education, the guidelines clearly tell us education is the cornerstone of asthma management and asthma and achieving successful outcomes and then looking at a therapeutic assessment is the patient you bring them back to clinic uh, when you know uh, within a few you know four to six weeks for reevaluation is this is are they responding what's their spirometry what's their um, other objective measurements showing that asthma control is achieved so Let's talk a moment too about uh, devices, jet nebulizers versus vibrating mesh. I'm going to go ahead and show you um, the the uh, mechanism of action. But the jet nebulizer uses a compressed air that which is forced through the orifice of the area under low pressure, and um, there's a liquid withdrawn through this perpendicular nozzle to form droplets, and then as a baffle with the nebulizer is used to facilitate the formation um, and, and, um, of an aerosol cloud. We do see this covered on a lot of um, uh, insurance formularies. The uh, mesh nebulizer, though, provides increased portability, and I see some patients that I've prescribed this that ha they say it's convenient, especially playing, you know, sports or or with their active lifestyle. Um, comparable lung deposition and increased ease of, uh, you know, of use compared to jet nebulizers. Um, the mesh nebulizer aerosolizes medication through a tiny vibrating disc, and it's over a thousand laser laser drilled holes, as you can see uh, in this picture here. 
and the websites there. All right, I just provided you with this chart. I'm not going to go into uh, all of this, but looking at the advantages and disadvantages of um, the jet nebulizer with the mesh nebulizer, the jet nebulizers um, cheaper, um, the mesh nebulizers faster, and uh, but maybe more expensive. And again, a picture for you looking at the different um, nebulizers, jet nebulizers, and the different um, mesh nebulizers. Okay, moving right along, let's look at technological interventions. For um, early 2018, there were over 325,000 mobile health apps available to smartphone uh, smartphone owners worldwide, and with with 200 additional health apps that's being launched just about every day. And I do work with a lot of pediatrics and a lot of um, of uh, adolescents who show me and teach keep me current on this, but apps, computer programming, text messaging, internet websites, and social media groups, uh, MP3 players. Uh, one example on the market contains um, 18 essential features. I'm not going to, I'm not recommending uh, any, I, any app or promoting any app here, but I just want to tell you there's one that has about 18 essential features um, for subscribing patients and then clinics where we can talk back and forth with the provider and I can talk to the patient through this and they can talk to me and it records actualizations you know it's just like um, did you use your medicate your uh, reliever medication 15 minutes before you play football or sports and then I can see you know yes on the device that they did it also looks at use of prescription medications to improve adherence uh, and teaching opportunities it looks at emergency room visits uh, real-time population oversight and uh, management of se and secure uh, notification between the app user and uh, us as the healthcare provider or um, the asthma educator. In contrast, literature shows there are potential barriers disseminating um, cost, uh, the need for special staffing, and the ability to address social determinants. And I have run into this in clinical practice. Now let's look at the asthma care team. We as, as we said at the beginning of this webinar, we want to understand and identify steps for implementing uh, good self-management and what strategies can we use. Well, we want to develop a multi multidisciplinary uh, working group. Uh, this is clearly evidence-based um, practice, and, it, and Gina document does a great job this year of telling us this. We want to assess the current status of asthma care. What gaps are they having? Where are they falling short? Why have they had three or four emergency room uh, visits the, since you saw them last? Or saw them in your, you know, saw them in your um, clinic? What are the barriers? What, we want to select and implement a framework and strategies that work best for the patient, individualized patient care, putting them at the center of the asthma care team. And looking at a step-by-step -step plan, what target population, what, pho what we could also add here, what phenotypes, is this a phenotypic asthma, uh, and how can we evaluate these outcomes. We want to identify local resources, we want to set timelines. We want to them to achieve good control. Uh, we want to set goals and objectives. We want to distribute tasks to members, and this in even includes family members and other caregivers. And then routinely evaluate outcomes. You know, at follow-up visit, if they that's a big barrier is losing our patients to follow up. Why didn't they come back to asthma education class? Why didn't they go to um, asthma camp? You know, why didn't they go to their uh, provider visits? So we want to continuously review progress, results to determine strategies and, modif and um, which require modifications. Lack of asthma self-management. Some challenges we see are lack of, of asthma certif certified asthma educators. Um, and looking at reimbursement problems. Different cultures and ethnicities hold various beliefs and practices. You know, some, uh, this could be a whole nother webinar, but but some uh, looking at um, other alternative therapies, you know, uh, complementary therapies. A lot of people use like, um, 
um, different strategies such as buying, I had a patient recently bought a Chihuahua dog to get rid of their asthma. So we have to understand this and how does this impact their disease control? We want to look at asthma coalitions forming not only a local partnership but a national and state partnership. There are great asthma coalitions throughout the country and I hope you have one in your region or your area but asthma coalitions provide a broad-based multi-organization community partnership that brings together the community, the stakeholder, the patient and each local asthma coalition works to develop goals and objectives to meet that patient's need. It's patient-centered and the, it's based on evidence-based practice. So what does the program need to include a self, with um, self-management? We want to provide patient education. We want to assess and monitor severity. We want to avoid exposure to risk factors and identify risk factors as well and establish medications for chronic management, adults and children, and establish plans for managing the exacerbation, have a game plan established, and provide routine follow-up care. So what does control actually look at? As we finish up this webinar section, I want to tell you the guidelines, Gina, and 2019 and the Expert Panel Report 3, say define control as the degree to which manifestations of asthma are min minimized by therapeutic interventions and goals of therapy are met. So looking at impacting free, you know, the, the complications of frequency and intensity of symptoms, what are their functional limitations, and then what negative effects uh, are present with the treatment. We can ask our patient, and please, this is a good take home message, and please do this with every encounter, uh, every patient encounter. Baylor rules of two. Does the patient take their rescue medicine more than two times a week? Do they wake up at night more than two times a month? Does the patient refill their rescue or reliever medication more than two times a year? And has your patient required oral prednisone more than two times a year? If you can answer yes to any of these questions, you're, you're, it is out of your the asthma is uncontrolled. Um, Bill talked to us about the asthma control test. These are just for your reference. Um, some people say uh, looking, and they're they're based on Baylor Rules of Two by Dr. Millard in uh, Dallas, Texas, um, asking those questions. Every patient you should, uh, every encounter should. Uh, uh, asthma it should be um, provided with every patient should be provided with an asthma control test before they see the provider or the asthma educator. This is a track for um, children zero to five. So there are um, zero to five, five to 11 and 12 and above for assessing control. This is primarily for your reference. I want to touch briefly, there's a school-based asthma management program because adolescents and school-age children require a lot of, they spend a third, you know, more than a third of their life at school, but the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology developed this uh, school-based allergy and asthma management program, and it was introduced in the uh, 116th Congress, and it provides further support. Um, I encourage you to um, look this up on the uh, on the internet and you and look at the um, opportunities available in your area. Um, the goal is to improve health and school related outcomes for children with asthma, which requires the use of school based partnerships and um, focuses on an integrated coordination uh, with the family's clinician and the school nurse. So um, as I finish up my uh, section, I want to leave you with asthma at school, adolescents and school aged children. Coaches and athletic trainers provide a very, play a very extensive role in, as, in achieving good asthma control. Um, we have to, coaches need to identify when their, their athlete is having increased signs and symptoms of worsening asthma. Um, sometimes they find that challenging. Another uh, another challenge is does the patient with asthma able to communicate, yes, I at my asthma's out of control. Do they understand they need to pre-medicate 15 minutes before um, and good warm-up, a 10-minute warm-up and a 10-minute cool-down after activity.
So the goal of us as the asthma educator, the provider, the nurse practitioner, the respiratory therapist, the pharmacist, we need to teach patients and their family to to that asthma to achieve good asthma control so they can live a full active life with minimal risk and min minimal exacerbations. We have provided you with resources and um, for your uh, for your um, um, opportun for opportunities that you might need. I do want to say self-management education must be reinforced with a written personalized asthma action plan and it must provide a summary of regular management strategies and how to recognize a deteriorating uh, asthma and what actions to take. Well, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Bill and I look forward to your questions. Before we begin questions and answers, Tim has a few reminders for us, for the audience. Thank you, Bill and Karen, for your excellent presentation. We've received several questions from the audience, but before we get to the questions, I would like to tell people how to obtain continuing education credits for attending. Remind it, be reminded that this educational activity is approved for one contact hour. And to obtain continuing education credits, you want to go to saxtesting.com slash BO, and you'll need to register at that site. Complete the evaluation, and upon successful completion, you'll be able to print your certificate of completion. So we have a few minutes available for questions and answers. And I'll get started with Bill. So Bill, uh, when selecting a medication delivery device, which patients might benefit from an inhaler with a spacer and which patients might benefit from a nebulizer? Well, thank you, Tim. Um, that's a, there's a lot of pieces and parts to this that you need to consider. Uh, one is going to be the age of the patient. Uh, the GINA guidelines uh, actually mentions that the nebulizer is preferred for those patients who are zero to three years old or if they may be in the emergency room with an exacerbation. Um, that's the a nebulizer use there. Uh, once you get to children five years old and older, Gina recommends using an inhaler with a valve holding chamber and that could be used with a mask uh, for those younger kids uh, or with no mask if they're able to uh, take that, uh, you know, without having to use a mask and they can just inhale it straight through into their mouth. Uh, they do also mention the, using an anti-static uh, valve holding chamber or washing it uh, maybe once a week in some uh, soapy water. It helps to knock down that potential buildup of static that would grab the medication and keep it from being delivered. Um, you know, but just, like I say, trying to figure out which one to use sometimes can be a little tricky. Uh, if you have someone with a severe asthma attack, their inspiratory flow rate may be too low to actually access the medication. So you need to, to evaluate that and assess, you know, is this patient able to actually pull through, the, say, a dry powder inhaler with enough flow to get the medication? Um, uh, technique is very important. Another part of this would be the portability. As you get into the uh, older kids and teenagers and young adults, um, you know, having to rely on a nebulizer is really kind of limiting, and portability is another issue with that. Uh, so there's a lot of um, a lot of considerations in there, uh, but primarily the, the important part is remembering that uh, a nebulizer administration of a dose of medication is equivalent to, um, or the uh, meter dose inhalers or the dry powder inhalers, it's, it's equivalent as far as delivery that, of that dose if you've got good technique and good proper inspiratory flow. So it's, it becomes sometimes, um, you know, you want to ask the patient. Uh, that helps to direct it a little bit, but uh, those are some of the considerations I think that we have to have there, you know, to, to make sure that we're doing the right thing for our patients. So I hope that answered the question. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Bill. Now, Karen, uh, with a wealth of new medications and medication delivery devices on the market, there may be some confusion on the part of the asthma patient regarding what drug to use and how to use the devices correctly. How can we simplify this for our patients and minimize medication errors? That's a great question. <laughs> and oftentimes uh, we see this in clinical practice 
uh, which medicine, which medication do we use? We're going to look at asthma phenotypes, and we're going to be seeing that more and more and more within the next uh, two to three years, asthma phenotypes and endotypes. But looking at how do we simplify this for our patients to prevent uh, medication errors, the key is asthma education. Um, I mentioned earlier that asthma guidelines tell us education is the key, uh, is the cornerstone to achieving good asthma control and knowledge is power. We want the provider to construct the appropriate treatment regimen. It needs to be easy for the patient and it needs to be understandable. Um, to help minimize errors is not is to uh, teach correctly and have with a return demonstration Every intervention, every educational intervention must be accompanied by return demonstration. Um, they can, for adherence, uh, let's see, looking at keeping medications in a usual location. Sometimes they keep them in a in a container by their bat in the bathroom before use uh, before they brush their teeth, especially if they're on an inhaled corticosteroid, uh, brushing their teeth and rinsing their mouth out and spitting after using the inhaled corticosteroid. Uh, using um, integrating a medication as part of their daily routine. I wake up. I um, use my inhaler, I brush my teeth, you know, and then uh, at lunch, I, you know, ex ex just making it, just integrating it as a, um, a routine, part of their daily, tr you know, daily routine. And then oftentimes, if we could teach our patients to take the medication at the same time every day, um, that really increases memory, um, you know, to is a good reminder. And then only use, uh, so that does get challenging with medications as needed, such as albuterol relievers, uh, looking at signs and symptoms, they need to keep a calendar on when they use that, and perhaps maybe that would help them from using their controller. One thing I do see is, is I see patients confusing their controller with their reliever. So again, asthma education is vital. You know, tell me which one is your controller and which one is the reliever. And then other, lastly, probably a written calendar. And the old fashioned calendar is always great. Or um, the apps that we talked about early, all the, you know, 200 new apps a day for healthcare models, you know, is, is, um, is provided to us. We have that at our disposal for those who have a smartphone. Terrific, Karen. Uh, back to you, Bill. What's the current recommendation regarding the use of spacers with quick relief medications? Well, that's, um, you know, spacers are, are used to be a, a kind of a big issue, and I think there's, we're starting to kind of move away a little bit from using spacers these days, uh, as long as the patient has really good uh, technique for using their quick relief medications. Uh, but that's, you know, we're, we're kind of in a a uh, bit of a fog now as far as our spacers are going to be something going forward. Um, some patients really can use one and it does well for them. Uh, it reduces how much uh, exposure they may have to an inhaled steroid, uh, but some of the newer um, MDIs and uh, particularly DPIs, there's not a spacer for those. Uh, or they may have a, a strange mouthpiece that they've, nobody's designed a spacer that would work. So it's kind of a, a like I say, a bit of a fog as to what we're going to do going forward. Uh, but I think as long as the patient has really good technique uh, and they're doing the right inspiratory flow, what we talked about earlier, um, you know, usually that can work pretty much with a direct administration uh, without having a spacer in place. It's just, it depends on the patient really. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Karen, in your practice, how do you measure medication adherence? Well, primarily we look at pharma, pharma, um, pharmacy refills. We um, you have access to that with our electronic health records and our nurses um, check that. And if they say, oh yes, I'm using my inhaled corticosteroid two puffs twice daily, just as you ordered, but they haven't refilled it, it's like, okay, where where is this medication coming from? So, um, or if I've given them a sample and um, it exceeded the I mean, the sample was completed before their, you know, the days before follow-up visits. So we look at pharmacology or um, pharmacology refills, um, pharmacy refills, I should say. We, I try to do in our practice shared decision making, where the patient is at the center of the team, and what can we do? Um, a lot of times I use, I don't think it's manipulative. I try, but it might be. Um, 
um, look, if you if you adhere to your medical treatment regimen that we agreed upon, it's an agreed medical treatment regimen, you're going to be able to participate in sports. You're going to be able to achieve asthma control. You're going to win um, school Olympics or, you know, the school team, uh, sports at the school team. Another thing I like to look at is miss school days. How many days of school have you missed? How many and why did you miss that? If we look at um, uncontrolled asthma, the literature tells us 14 days of, um, if the student misses 14 days of, because of asthma, their asthma is clearly under control. And that doesn't count all the other extra curricular activities they miss because of school, I mean, before school. And then um, bringing a medication calendar or the apps. I love the asthma apps, again, that we've talked about, especially for the tech savvy patients or the, um, uh, we use, you know, several of those propeller, kids app, uh, asthma check, there's assist me with inhalers or asthma track. So, so multiple approaches to looking at medication adherence. Terrific. Uh, Bill, other than asthma action plans, are there other tools that you find valuable for patients to use, like symptom diaries or peak flow meters? Well, with our practice, you know, we have a, a transient population. We're, we're dealing a lot with uh, uninsured patients, uh, so sometimes it's hard to, uh, to have a good ongoing um, track on this. But we found, you know, asking patients about their symptoms, maybe having them keep a symptom diary is important. Um, and a lot of times the environmental control plans and uh, asking about what's their environment look like and reminding them of issues with, uh, you know, dogs or cats or carpeting in the home. Uh, are they changing their air conditioner filters? Uh, tools like that, uh, you know, the environmental control uh, can be a big piece to this. What are they being exposed to and are there ways to maybe minimize that? Uh, so trying to, you know, help them target their symptoms and be aware of what's going on with their asthma, uh, you know, and like I say, by a symptom diary or environmental controls. Um, there's also some patients may benefit from using a peak flow meter. Um, and then, you know, the home visits, uh, we mentioned earlier, uh, if that's a possibility, uh, for your area, that may be a, a way to impact um, the patients who are really suffering. Uh, I know telehealth is also starting to arise. <laughs> We're seeing that come up on the on the horizon here that uh, we may be able to do some uh, kind of virtual visits to the home environment by telehealth, and, and that may be a tool that will become more and more important as we move forward. Okay. Uh, once again, back to Karen. Results from some studies reveal that two out of three uncontrolled asthma patients believe that their condition is under control when in fact it may not be. Do you believe that part of the issue is that there is a disconnect between how a patient or caregiver defines asthma control and how a healthcare practitioner and guidelines define asthma control? Absolutely, Tim. Um, it's very challenging sometimes to pers to um, for patients to perceive their symptoms, they perceive their symptoms as controlled, which it's not. But the role of us as healthcare professionals, we need to establish a current level of control. The literature shows us that there's a there's lacking in provider-based um, use of evidence-based practice guidelines, um, and why that is, we don't know. Um, sometimes um, we look at, you know, this is the way I learned it, and this is, I do it this way because that's the way it's done, um, because this is the way I've always done it, instead of using evidence-based practice tools that we have so readily available. Um, the literature also shows about 70% of patients that are being prescribed therapy, like with an inhaled corticosteroid and long-acting beta agonist, only 28% report that there are well-controlled asthma according to their asthma control test. But um, I do think there is a disconnect there. I think as healthcare professionals, it is our it is our obligation, um, and I can't stress that enough, to keep current in the literature, to attend webinars like this, to uh, understand, you know, understand the guidelines. And we must know how, um, how to asthma control refers to the extent to which manifestations of asthma have reduced or eradicated the therapy. Okay, one final question, uh, and I'll toss this out to either of you who would like to answer it. Uh, how do you instruct patients on trigger avoidance, 
such as airborne allergens, irritants, and viral respiratory infections. Well, Karen, I'll jump in here and talk, and then maybe if you've got a, an addition to that, how about it? Sure. Uh, but, you know, um, I think a big piece uh, is to talk about flu shots and vaccinations uh, to help protect on that level, um, you know, to avoid the triggers and the uh, airborne allergens, et cetera, uh, bringing to mention things like their air conditioner filter. Uh, what happens when they're vacuuming, if they've got carpets or whatever, do they have a good HEPA filter on a vacuum system? Um, the environmental control is important, you know, we've talked about that a little bit. Uh, smoking, as far as some of our teenagers may be uh, starting to experiment with that, or if the parents are smoking, that can help. We need to talk about that issue, um, you know, just being aware of what are their triggers and the things that they're allergic to and the irritants, um, you know, avoiding crowds and people who are sick. Uh, those are the kind of things that may help uh, patients to reduce uh, the, the um, exposure to things that could make their asthma get a lot worse. Uh, so that's, you know, the things I think about when, when trying to instruct patients on this issue. Fear I echo that as well. That's that's excellent, Bill. Um, I also ask when in clinic when what is their goal and objective? What what do they want to do, and what are they doing? Uh, what can they not do because of asthma? I tell them you want to control your asthma. Don't let your asthma control you. So establishing goals and objectives. I have some. I have a few patients. Um, this this um, school semester that have uncontrolled asthma, actually three, that are dependent upon, their grades depend upon going to a college and to get scholarships. So that's a big incentive to uh, be adherent to their treatment regimen. So bottom line, I, I try to establish what are their goals and objectives and what can I do uh, and what can the asthma care team do to help them achieve good control. Well, that's fabulous. Uh, Bill and Karen, I want to thank you for all the effort you put into uh, this terrific presentation. Again, we want to thank Phillips Respironics for supporting this activity. Um, thank you all for attending and listening in, and this concludes our program.